I didn't realize when I began to look into financial independence that I had this unique story of being a physician and not only a hospice, not only a physician, but a hospice physician. So I take care of people at the end of life. And if you had asked me at the beginning of my journey, does that have anything to do with money? I would have said no. But as time goes on, I realize that the two fields are actually fairly interconnected. Welcome to the Real Estate and Financial Independence Podcast. I'm your host, Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. Whether you're a long-time listener or a first-time listener, thank you for being back for another episode. The title of today's episode is A Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence and Living a Regret-Free Life. This is an interview with my friend, Jordan Grummet. You might know him as Doc G from the Earn and Invest podcast, which I highly recommend. If you haven't checked that out yet, there's a lot of crossover from the topics of my show, a little bit less about real estate investing and more about financial independence and a lot of great conversations. And I'm interviewing Jordan today about the topic he wrote a book on recently. It's a new book called Taking Stock, a Hospice Doctor's Advice on Financial Independence, a Living a Regret-Free Life. So a similar topic. And he tells a lot of intriguing stories about his experience as a hospice doctor and what he's learned that'll help all of us as people seeking financial independence, but ultimately seeking to be happy, to be fulfilled. And why are we trying to earn this money in the first place? The topic of my show is doing what matters, is having a meaningful life. And so this is a conversation about that. And I promise you it's very applicable and it's good sometimes just to step back and think about you know, what are we aiming for here? What are we trying to accomplish? What do we, at the end of our lives, hope we don't regret not having done? So it's a very thought-provoking episode. I think you'll enjoy it, and I look forward to sharing some of Jordan's thoughts with you. But before we get to the interview, it's time for my weekly behind-the-scenes segment where I share a short snippet of what's going on with me and my real estate investing, finances, or business behind the scenes. And in this case, it's actually even beyond business. I wanted to share a few books with you that are always by my bedside. And we're going to be talking about living a regret-free life, so kind of life philosophy in this episode. And I thought it'd be good to share uh, some Stoic books that I really enjoy. You might, you may, may or may not know this, but I really enjoy Stoic philosophy, something I read a lot of, have been reading for a long time. And there are all sorts of books I could recommend. But if you're interested in the philosophy of the Stoics, it's one of the core philosophies of the Stoic is that you actually look at the end of your life and look backwards and say, you know, what kinds of things will I have regretted if I hadn't done them or if I didn't live a certain way or I didn't have a certain kind of character. And so there's a few different kind of jumping off points if you're interested in Stoicism. It's an uh, ancient philosophy from uh, Greece and from Rome, and it's applicable to all sorts of different backgrounds and cultures. But one of the, the, the books I think is really interesting is one, this very tiny little book called Courage Under Fire by James Stockdale. I have a copy here if you're looking at it on YouTube. I mean, you could literally read this in 30 minutes, 45 minutes, but it's one I pick up and just have underlined. It's a story of his being in prison during the Vietnam War and just the, the types of things he had, to, he had to approach with his own mindset to get through that, but not, not only to get through it, but to be a better person because of it. So a really interesting kind of more modern story. Another one that's really approachable is called The Art of Living. It's a modern translation or interpretation about Epictetus. Epictetus was a former Greek slave. So he was born as a slave and later on became a teacher to people, including Marcus Aurelius, later a Roman emperor, um, learned from a lot of Epictetus. But it's, if you're interested in Stoicism, it's very some of the other Stoics can be a little hard to follow. This is a really practical, you know, one page type, you know, chapter, but very pithy, but also very helpful. Um, you can read and kind of get into Epictetus is my probably my favorite uh, Stoic teacher right now. And then third and final, something called the Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday, another kind of modern interpreter of Stoicism. But each day you can just read a really short quote and just a lesson from that. So again, a little bit different take today on my behind the scenes, but I want to share with you if you're interested in the conversation we go into today about just life philosophy. Those are a few books that I recommend that would be good. I'll have links to all of those in the show notes for today's episode. Now let's get started with my interview with Jordan Grummet, otherwise known as Doc G. Hey Jordan, welcome back to the podcast. It is so much a pleasure to hang out with you again, Chad, and to talk about what's been going on. Yeah, absolutely. We've we've had this COVID lapse where I think we saw each other virtually during that time, but to reconnect with not only friends, but also to celebrate this book that you've written. I am I'm so excited to share about taking stock 
and what that what you have learned from your your career in hospice, but also your own journey, uh, you know, as as a as in financial independence. This is just an excellent book. I wanted to say that first, Jordan. I, I've I've read a lot of books, you know, being a podcast host, I get books sent to me, but this one was really it was moving, and it was I, knowing you as a friend and somebody who tells amazing stories and really goes deep on subjects. It was it hit hit that exact same note, and I was just like, yes, this is this is Jordan. This is perfect. So just congratulations on putting this, a wonderful book together. Well, I appreciate you saying that. You know, I didn't realize when I began to look into financial independence that I had this unique story of being a physician and not only a hospice, not only a physician, but a hospice physician. So I take care of people at the end of life. And if you had asked me at the beginning of my journey, does that have anything to do with money? I would have said no. But as time goes on, I realized that the two fields are actually fairly interconnected. Yeah. Well, I, I learned so much from so many stories in this book, Jordan, but in you know, just my background a little bit, I, I've been very into for the last, I mean, many years now, but stoicism has been a sort of a philosophy that just I've, has been infused in my life. And one of the core tenets of stoicism or one of the practices is looking at the end of your life and saying, okay, let's, let's have some quote negative visualization and say, this is we're all I'm, I'm on my way to death. And yet that could, that can inform my whole philosophy of how I live. And so I would love to start with that. I mean, you, you have, you're a physician, you've worked in different capacities as a physician, but what you're still doing and have had a lot of experience with is being a hospice physician. And you, you led in the book talking about death, which <laughs> some people want to say, wait a minute, you know, this is a, this is a morbid topic, but this is as somebody who is a philosopher, which I know you are, this is exactly where you have to, to start. And so my, my question is, you know, more the story, because I want to, I want to, one of the stories you led with was about your own personal first experience with death and how that led to so much, so many of the decisions you, you made in your life. So my father died when I was eight years old. And at that time, I wanted to be just like him. He was a doctor and I looked up to him and this had a profound impact on my life. I mean, at the time I had a learning disability, it was questionable whether I'd be able to learn how to read. They were thinking about holding me back a year in school. My father dies and it sticks in my brain that I'm going to be just like him. And it became a drive for a lot of what I accomplished over the next 20 or 30 years. Like I wanted to fill the role that he couldn't fill. I wanted to do what he wasn't able to do. I had kind of a one track mind. It provided me a sense of meaning and purpose and identity, which was really important during those years of my life. But only later would I realize that these visions of what I thought being a doctor was, it wasn't exactly what I had signed up for. Like it was more difficult in ways that I had never expected. There was more paperwork. There was more frustration. This idea of rushing into the room and saving the day, something that I had kind of grown up with, when I found it wasn't the reality, I had to face this idea, this fact that what I had decided was my identity and meaning, this connection I had to my father, maybe ultimately wasn't my purpose in life and wasn't bringing me as much happiness as I was hoping. And this was why I eventually discovered financial independence. When I started looking for a way outside of medicine, I started looking into my finances. And that was a the connection, probably my first connection between money and death was this idea that my father's death sent me in one direction in life that wouldn't ultimately make me totally happy. And money was going to be my lever to get out of that. So it was really my dad who both provoked me to get interested in medicine, but also probably led me to learn about financial independence and getting my financial house in order so that I could start doing things that were really important to me. You said something really interesting in the book, and I'm, I'm just paraphrasing because I don't have the quote right in front of me, but you essentially said the, the roots of the fire movement, and maybe you could just broaden this in general to people who focus on building wealth and using money kind of as the number one focus in their life, that the root of a lot of that is fear. And that, that struck me because it was when I thought about your story, you just, you just told about growing up and you know, we're all afraid of something. We're all afraid of many things. And for you, as I can just imagine as a eight-year-old kid, I mean, obviously what a earth shattering kind of event in your life, but at the root of that story, it seems like you said was the, the fear 
that you had to deal with of, of losing someone in your life. And then that kind of propelled you on. So when you, when you started looking at your money and realizing, all right, there's some other, other things going on here. Like what, what were some of the things you learned about that fear that had driven your, your story at that point? Well, I really realized that I think fear drives a lot of our behavior in so many different ways. I think we're afraid that we're going to die or die prematurely and hence never get accomplished what we want to accomplish. But instead of looking that straight on and saying, okay, what are the things I want to accomplish? How do I get there? A lot of times we focus on money instead. And I call this the money mind meld. And I talk a lot about the money mirage and this idea that money is this mirage and it's really easy for us to focus on, right? Because even though it's not necessarily easy to make lots of money, we kind of know what to do. We can work harder, we can side hustle, we can invest. It's really low hanging fruit. And I think because it's so low hanging fruit, we tend to focus on it. And it becomes our ultimate goal, as opposed to the goal being something much more difficult, which is, what is my meaning in this world? What is my purpose? And God forbid, I might die before I ever get to the conclusion of that meaning and purpose. So I think we put money out in front and ahead of this because it's easier. And that's all fine and dandy. I think at the beginning of your journey, when getting to enough money is really what consumes your mind. But there becomes a problem when you all of a sudden see that the path is clear. And then the question becomes, now what? And answering the now what can actually cause a lot of depression and anxiety. It certainly did for me when I realized that I had enough money to stop working. Like I had worked many, many years as a physician. I had saved a lot of money. I had been frugal. I had invested wisely. I had bought real estate. I had done all these things that consumed me thinking about money. And now I was free, but instead of feeling jubilant about being free, I was panicked. What am I gonna do with my life? Who am I? If I walk away from this identity of high money earner and physician, who am I then? What am I gonna do with myself? And I think a lot of us face that because we put money too much front and center and we forget that it's just a lever it's a tool, not a goal. And ultimately trying to work through those harder goals is what we really want to use our money to do. Uh, but we often forget that. And I think almost all of that, getting back to the beginning of your question, is based on fear. Fear of dying, fear of not being good enough, fear of not getting things you want accomplished. It's really easy to just focus on the easier things like money instead. I, I totally resonate with this. And I, I feel like when, when I heard you telling your own journey, if you know, there's obviously different beginnings and different drivers in the story, but that money being the easy part of it, like the business, the saving, the, it was sort of, it, it can be a distraction from some of the more important questions that just, you, know, you can put a business plan together. You can save money, especially people who are driven, who kind of naturally kind of fit into that, that mold. It's a little easy. It's just easier for that person to solve that than looking yourself in the mirror and saying, all right, like what's going to make me happy? Like what's going to make me fulfilled? And that's, it's a separate question. And I, I love how in the book, you, you talk about that nuance, uh, you know, it's, it's not like black and white. It's not like, yes, you should be a, you should, you should only be a hardcore saver and save a bunch of money quickly. And, or you should only focus on looking in the mirror and, you know, and only thinking about what makes you happy and ignore the you know money and finances. And like, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of a yes. And instead of a either or that you talked about. And one of the, if you, one of the stories, some of the stories you used to explain that were, these stories of you being a hospice physician, listening to people on their deathbeds talk about their life and how clear it had become once they had that terminal diagnosis. And so I'm, I'm wondering, do, do any of the, the stories come to mind for you that maybe were kind of aha, ahas for you, you in that other role, think, talking to other people that kind of brought to, brought to bear some of these, these ideas that you ended up writing about in the book? So finding out you're going to die is the great equalizer. And so if we allow money to be that mirage we chase after, when you find out you're dying, you realize that mirage no longer serves. Like I've got a set amount of time, maybe it's three months, maybe it's six months. I have to kind of accomplish what I want to accomplish before it's too late. And so I spend a lot of my working time dealing with people who are facing that reality 
And so their stories are interesting and amazing. One that I begin the book with is the story of Sam, who, when I told him he was going to die, he kind of gave up all pretense of excuses for why he couldn't travel. He happened to be one of those rare people who he was in good enough shape to still get around, but his diagnosis was such that we knew that he had three to six months. And in the time that he had left, every time I tried to call him or go see him, he was out of town. Like he went to Mardi Gras. He did a bunch of these things that he wanted to do because he had always told himself there was a reason he couldn't do it before. There was never enough money. There was never enough time but it was what his heart really desired. And when his girlfriend came into his house and found him dead in bed, he had died very peacefully from what we can tell. He actually had a packed suitcase on the side of his bed. And this story really resonated with me, partially because I had turned down so many trips throughout the years because of medical school or because we were too busy. I mean, my stepsister lived in Australia for like a few years and I didn't go visit her because I was too busy in medical school. My wife visited her sister when she was working in Russia and Moscow. And I didn't go there because I was in the middle of residency. All these stories, all these things I didn't do because there was always an excuse. And now I'm kind of looking back on it and realizing that, okay, I'm probably pretty lucky, fingers crossed. Maybe, you know, hopefully I'll live to 85 or 90. I have a lot of years. So I could sacrifice some of those early years, work really hard, defer gratification, not do some of those things I wanted to do because ultimately I saved enough money, I earned money, I stopped working and now I can go do a bunch of those things. But what if I had been like my father who died at 40? Like my dad died at 40. If he had deferred all his gratification the way I did, he would have never lived. And I can't imagine giving people this financial advice and saying, don't do those things you really want to do. Like we talk about YOLO, you only live once and say it's a really bad thing, but sometimes YOLO can be a good thing. Like sometimes you do need to jump off on a plane irresponsibly, put something else down and go have the time of your life. And if we don't pay homage to that, as much as we pay homage to investing in the stock market, We're making a mistake, especially for those people who are unlucky enough not to live forever. Um, Those people are really going to miss out if they don't learn how to enjoy some of life today. It's certainly something I learned from my own patients. Yeah, a word that came to mind a lot in the book, it's in the title of the book, is is regret. And you, you referenced not only some of your own experiences talking to people on their deathbed or after knowing that they're having a terminal illness, but also I think, I forget the name of the book. I should have done my homework a little bit better, but the five, there are five lessons from, from people's dying that were kind of just stood out. What, what were some of the regrets that people had that you've noticed that we might be able to learn from those of us who hopefully, you know, we'll see, have, have some days ahead of us, but what were some of those regrets that people most often came up with? So Bronnie Ware's book is called The Five Regrets of the Dying. It's like one of the most famous top five lists out there. And I'm not going to go through each one, but it's, you know, regrets that I didn't live a life that was more authentic regrets that I didn't give myself the ability not to work as much. There's five that they're listed out. You can certainly find it on the internet with me. I like to look at it more as investments. Like instead of the regrets, what did we invest in or fail to invest in And we really think about that at the end of life. So I think of things more like, did we invest in ourselves, right? Did we educate ourselves? Did we forgive ourselves for past indiscretions? Were we kind to ourselves? Did we invest in family and friends and community? Like, did we build a community around ourselves? Did we invest in knowledge, right? Did we learn something new every day? Did we fall asleep with our book in our hands? Those kind of things. So or, or did we invest in bad things, the, the things I call false gods? Like, did we worship money? Or, you know, did we spend our time investing in things like prestige and power? Like, think about the fact that you are a small speck in the human universe and your time here on earth is but just a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of all time. The truth of the matter is probably no one's going to remember you in 100 or 200 years How does that make you feel? If that makes you feel really sad and uncomfortable, then you probably invest in power and prestige a little too much, 
right? On the other hand, if that kind of makes you feel comforting, like, well, since no one's really going to remember me in 200 years, since I'm just here for a speck of time, maybe I can really start concentrating on what's important, the people and the things that bring me some sense of joy and the investments that really serve here and now. Like if you can put it in that perspective, I think it changes everything. So to me, it's not as much about regrets. I take a little more positive spin on it. I like to think about what we should and shouldn't invest in. And that's something I think the people who are dying think a lot about. Yeah. And I like the word investment because I think people who are oriented towards money can understand that, but not just looking at it from the the tool of money, but looking at it from your, your life energy, your time, your, how, how are you investing these things that are truly limited, you know, and, and you, that's, that's, that's ultimately what we have to invest, right? Yeah. I mean, people talk about how money compounds, but we forget that joy and experience and knowledge, all those things compound too. And so I think we do have to move away from that aspect of investing only means money. We can invest in a lot of things. Those things can compound and bring us greater joy later on in life. Mm. Some people might listen to this and obviously we're a financial podcast. And so we're going to have a lot of uh, maybe people like you and I who are, who have front front loaded a lot of our money, you know, our our saving, investing, We're, we're, we're thinking about these things in the first place, but I love how in the book, you didn't, you didn't just leave it and say, this is all one thing. You brought in a uh, Maslow in the hierarchy of needs to, which I want want you to explain a little bit of, but but the idea is that we are, as human beings are pretty complicated (laughs) and and figuring out what makes us tick and what makes us happy is really at best a, a a competition of different things. And so maybe you could talk about the idea that, you know, we, we do have these purpose and our identity and our goals and things we have to figure out for ourselves. And there's also on the other end, there's this, these animal needs of, I need some financial oxygen, you know, I need to have some warmth and I need, so, so neither one is right or wrong to focus on, but maybe could you explain how that under you know, looking at it from multiple needs can help you understand a little bit more what we're trying to accomplish here. So there are two stories that I brought up when I talk about Maslow's pyramid. So people know what Maslow's pyramid is pretty much the pyramid of needs and the lowest level of the base is much more about things like survival, right? Like food and oxygen and safety. And as you move up the period and it feels very stepwise, you get to the top, which is self-actualization, which is kind of like that idea of love and contentedness and connection and all those kind of higher level things we think about. I had two patients that I took care of and I like to juxtapose them together because it points to my problem with Maslow. So I had one patient who dearly loved his wife who was in the nursing home and she was dying of dementia and he was penniless. In fact, he was so penniless, he had to actually divorce his wife even though he still loved her very much. It's called a Medicaid divorce so that she could qualify for Medicaid and he wouldn't have to spend down what little money he had to live on. She dies, he goes back home, gets sick himself, lives in a little apartment with almost no comfort, nothing, no money, et cetera, dies quietly there with hospice shortly after his wife. If you look at Maslow's pyramid, you would think that this gentleman didn't do so well, right? I mean, he didn't have the basics he needed of food and shelter and comfort. On the other hand, he lived a very full life of love and happiness and memories of his wife, he was almost really at that self-actualization point, that top of the pyramid, without really covering the bottom of the pyramid very well. On the other hand, I had another patient who was an industrialist, this guy who owned this multi-billion dollar company, who owned a part of the hospital wing that he died in, but he died alone with family members who were too busy worrying, worrying about their own issues and problems and worrying about him very little. He died by himself and no one really cared from his family. And so now you have this gentleman who so clearly had made his way up the first few steps of Maslow's pyramid, but didn't quite get to that self-actualization, that contentedness, that connection, that being with people So the point that I made in the book is I think we need to flatten Maslow's pyramid because instead of thinking of working on these things stepwise, money first, 
get shelter, get a job, then start working on connections and contentedness, et cetera. I think we have to work on all of them at the same time. And so you could have someone who is poor, but happy. And then you can have someone who's rich, but sad. I think instead of spending all those beginning years, just thinking about those first few levels, we need to start thinking about meaning, purpose, and our true identity from the beginning. And I think that's a much better look at happiness than what the current pyramid looks like. Yeah, I love it. I, I, I've studied the hier hierarchy of needs as well. And I've always, similar to you, it sounds like, had a little issue just with the order or the fact that there's steps. <laughs> you know, not, not that they're not valuable precepts to, to apply to your life, but I, I really love those, those stories in particular, how they show the extremes of where that can take you, of you've got to... In, in an ideal world, you know, we're all working to improve our lives in multiple facets, whatever those might be. And so let, let's, let's segue from that because I think any, you know, any person who's listening to this, and I know for myself too, you're, you're looking for some guidance of like, all right, well, how do I figure out that kind of stuff for myself? Like, all right, it's, it's, you know, do I focus just on being happy in the moment? Do I focus just on being, you know, building wealth and deferring my gratification? And you, you, you had a whole chapter and a whole part of the book on uh, sort of a phrase that you've come to learn for yourself called this, this art of subtraction. And I was wondering if you could ex explain something, because that sounds like to me, as I read that, I'm thinking this is sort of how Jordan has thought about his own way to try to apply some of these principles that you talked about and these lessons you learned about earlier in the book was that kind of your application of that to some, so in a practical way. So maybe you can unpack that a little bit. So first of all, let me say that when I began thinking about this idea of art of subtraction, I came from a very privileged place, right? So what happened is I worked really hard. I saved a lot of money. I had great financial modeling from my parents. I accumulated wealth. And then when I got to the point where I didn't like my job anymore, I said, hmm, how can I make this better? And the way I made it better was I started looking at my daily tasks and saying, what brings me joy? What do I like doing? What do... I not like doing like, what are those things on Sunday night I'm getting anxious about and don't want to go to work on Monday? How can I get rid of those things from my daily activities? Now, at this point, I was financially independent. So it was very easy for me to look at my work life and start subtracting out those things that weren't giving me joy anymore. So I didn't like working on weekends. So you know what? I'm going to get rid of weekends. I didn't like taking phone calls in the middle of the night. So I'm going to get rid of that. I subtracted and subtracted. Eventually what I was left with, which is what I do today, which is the one thing that really brings me joy is doing hospice work. The work I do now, I would do even if I wasn't being paid for it. And that's kind of how I know that I've subtracted to the right level. Like I would just do this because I think it is a good thing. Like I said, I came from a place of privilege. So for me, that was easier. But I think we can start thinking about subtraction even when we're not in that same place of privilege in a few different ways. I look, for instance, at my in-laws. My in-laws came from Iran to the United States, lost everything, and pretty much had to start their time in the U.S. with very, very little money. So they started looking at the art of subtraction, not necessarily from what job they were in, but from what they would spend their money on, right? So they were in Iran and they were upper middle class and they could have nice cars and nice clothes and those kind of things. When they got to the US, they moved right from a big four bedroom household to an apartment with two bedrooms for five people. So they had to subtract out certain luxuries and that eventually gave them choices. As they got more and more successful, my stepdad worked in a shoe store and he got held up at gunpoint twice. Now, by that time, he had accumulated a little money and he had to start thinking about the art of subtraction again. And this is a case where there was no privilege, not like me, the doctor who has a lot of money. This was a guy who had immigrated the US with just enough money to survive. He was just starting to make a little money. And then he got held up and he had to say to himself, well, this is dangerous. And even though I'm not in the greatest position, he started using the art of subtraction and subtracted out his job at the shoe store by taking the little money he had and buying a multifamily building. And so he bought an apartment complex with 10 units. He used the little money he had as a down payment and eventually built that into a business that was paying him far more 
than he was getting from the shoe store. So he was able to use the art of subtraction even when he just had a little bit of leeway but there were consequences, right? So he owned this building and at three in the morning when he got a phone call because a water main had broken or something like that and he didn't have enough money to have a maintenance person there at the moment, he had to get out of bed and drive over and deal with whatever was going on. So even if you're not rich per se, you can use the art of subtraction, but the idea is to start thinking about what things give you meaning and purpose and then compare that to what you're doing today and what gives you friction and starting to match them up better. And so it's not a perfect process. In fact, it's not a process that has to happen today or tomorrow. It's more a long-term goal. So does that mean switching employers? Maybe it's your employer is bad and you need to go to another employer. Does that mean doing something else in your same company? Maybe the job you're doing today isn't the one you want, but your company offers other opportunities you could take advantage of. Maybe it is leaving what you do and finding something else that's more lucrative or brings you more pleasure. The idea is to be constantly whittling away to create that life that's worthwhile because you and I both know, we don't know what's going to happen to the market today or tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen with inflation. So we don't know when that day is that we can quote unquote, say we're financially independent. We may never reach that day where we can retire early. So I think we got to focus on what makes work livable now. Like, how do we give our career some real longevity so that we enjoy it at the moment so that we can keep doing it so that we don't feel like we have to run away? How do we get to the point where we would do what we're doing because we enjoy it enough that even if we weren't getting paid, we would still do it? Just imagine if everyone could get to that place in their career, they wouldn't need to retire early. They could probably spend a lot more time using their money as an opportunity fund to go do fabulous things because they knew that they could come back to their job, which they liked doing. They could still save money. They could still work towards financial independence, but it means something completely different when you enjoy what you're doing from day to day. The, the rush to get there disappears. And I think we end up enjoying each moment a little better. Mm. You know, the thing I love about that process, Jordan, is it focuses on the actual goal, which is our life and our very practical day-to-day -day schedule and the practical activities that we do. Because a lot of the, the goals that we traditionally think about, how much our net worth is going to be, how much income we're going to make, you know, is, is measurable as those are. They're, they're, they're pretty abstract. And there's a couple of levels between those goals and the things that actually we live, you know, the, our day-to-day -day lives. So I, I really like the this idea of subtraction, because it, the, the, almost like as if you're an engineer building something, the thing you're building is your day-to-day -day life. Like it's the schedule, it's the, the activities you do. And it, it made me think of my own uh, mother, who's a, a dentist and was a successful dentist and had, you know, but she used a lot of her financial leverage and my dad was a real estate investor. So as years went by and they had more leverage, her schedule went from when I was born, she was working six days a week and, you know, had to, had me upstairs and would nurse me in between patients as the story is, is told. And then, so she was working lots and lots of hours over the years though, she went down to the very end. She was working two hours a week and the schedule she liked still having, you know, most of the week off and that, that, you know, for, again, a place of privilege as a medical professional, you have a lot, a lot of income, but we all in our own ways can start chipping away, almost like you're sculpting something, you know, you're chipping away, chipping away, chipping away at the schedule itself. And like, which activities do I want to get rid of? Which, act, you know, for me, like I'm in, uh, when I started doing the podcasting, YouTubing business, this was totally a hobby or blogging, you know, it was a hobby. I just, I like the content. I like to interview people like you. I like to write. And then, but all of a sudden these other things came along with it as I, you know, should have known they do, you know, oh, you got to pay the bills for this email. You got to, you got, you're overwhelmed with emails and all these, this administrative stuff is happening. And so for me, it was, how can I make this business exactly do the things I want to do with my time, which is creating the content, interacting with people. And so you have to hire people or you have to get rid of those things or whatever the case might be. But this, it all kind of fits under this umbrella of the art of subtraction and it even financial independence itself fits under that umbrella because yeah. then money is just a tool to get that schedule and those activities in this continually optimizing kind of journey that we're on to, to live the best life we can. Yeah. I love the, the fact that, you know, real estate investors are great subtractors, right? What do you do with the property that stinks? What do you do with the property that's giving you continual problems? 
eventually you subtract it from your portfolio. Yeah. The first yeah. chance you get, you get rid of it. What do you do with tenants, right? Year after year, they're not working. At some point when their lease is up, you get rid of them. It's the same idea. It's like, you know what in your work life makes it easier. What would it do for your general career or for your home life? What can you get rid of that's just giving you friction? So, so to give some people a practical exercise that they could do after this, you, you, you had a, uh, something called the reverse lottery test. And I know that there's lots of exercises like this in the book, but this one in particular, I thought was great. Could you explain to what people, what that is, and maybe that's something they could do after they listen to this to sort of help them figure out what they might want to subtract in their own life. Yeah. I, I think the reverse lottery test is this really good way of looking at how you spend your time, right? So Imagine that you just won the lottery. You won more money than you could ever spend, hundreds of millions of dollars. What would you do? Like, so the first thing people say is, oh, I'd buy this nice house or I buy this nice car. A lot of it is based on what they would add, right? But after you get done adding, you have to actually start looking at what are you doing in your life that you wouldn't do anymore? So a lot of people say, I wouldn't work or, you know, I hide, hire someone to do the lawn work or they come up with this list of things that they wouldn't do anymore. And really the whole goal of this mental experiment is to then look at what your life would look like after you win the lottery. What would you subtract out? What brings no value to you and you'd get rid of? And then compare it to your planner, right? Go into your phone or look at your written planner, whatever it is. And compare your activities that you're doing today to those activities you'd be doing if you had all this money. And the big question is, well, why are you doing all these things you don't want to do? Now, granted, of course, we don't have hundreds of millions of dollars. So there are some things we have to do that we don't want to do. But that's perfect fodder for starting to think about the art of subtraction. What are those things you would get rid of? Well, how can we start working today before we're financially independent, before we have millions in the bank? How can we start working on getting rid of some of those things now? Getting rid of that, I like to use the word friction because it's friction in our lives. What causes you friction, whether it's objects or activities or people? It's all the same idea. How can we start creating a better frictionless system? And it starts with the art of subtraction. And it's almost like until we have that gap, until you can visualize what the ideal would be when you had millions and millions of dollars, you never see that gap maybe on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, you, I mean, all of us would just continue going, oh, well, it's not that bad. I'm just going to keep doing what it, but until you recognize that fr friction by comparing it and contrasting it with the gap of what it could be, you, you, you've, you've almost not allowed yourself because it's too far out there to be, to think, oh, I, I couldn't get rid of that or that, but we're all pretty creative people. You know, we, we, we have salt problem solving built into our DNA. And I, I found that such a wonderful exercise because it, it forces you to have that contrast today on a very practical level. And there might be things that don't cost you money at all. You could ask your boss to let you do this kind of remote work for one day a week that would get, remove the friction of commuting on Monday because you hate that. Like, I just hate this Monday commute and I'm having to drive for an hour in Atlanta. You know, I'm just thinking of that's where I grew up in Atlanta. And that would, that would be the number one friction for me. I'd be like, get, get me out of this job where I have to commute every day. And if that's the case, there might be some, you start asking yourself the question openly, how could I get out of that commute on Monday morning? Maybe there's another way to do it. Maybe there's another approach. So who knows, you know, you, until you ask yourself that question and contrast that you're not gonna, you're not gonna have an answer to that. What I like about that exercise is it uses the money mirage, something I think which is a fairly negative thing, money clouding our searching for deeper meaning and purpose, and it turns it around and it takes advantage of the money mirage. It's like, okay, let's give you all your monetary goals. Yeah. What would you do in life? And then let's turn it back to what life looks like today. So as opposed to the money mirage being a bad thing, let's use it as a tool to learn more about ourselves. Love it. So, so I'm going to continue this theme that m money is not, not important. It is important. It's a tool, something we can use. I think most of us recognize that, but it, I love how you, you continued in the book and you got into a chapter where you talk about the story of three brothers and it essentially turns into an archetype that I want to dig into a little bit, but can you tell the story of three brothers? And I have some follow-up questions on that. Sure. And, and let me, before we even get into the story, the first part of the book really talks about trying to better understand your true purpose, identity, and connections, because I think that's actually more important than the money aspect to begin with. Right. 
But towards the middle of the book, we actually get deeper into the money. And the reason why is money is important. It just needs to be used as a tool to get those other things first. So I think if you're not in touch with your purpose, identity, connections, you're going to have trouble figuring out what you want to use the money for. But once you start getting an idea of what those things are, it's a good time to actually start thinking about the money so that you can A, support yourself and B, use it as a lever. So the parable of the three brothers is straightforward. They're three brothers. They all start in the same place, but they go in separate paths. The eldest brother is kind of the prototypical eldest brother, right? He likes to get things done. He wants to get through this path as soon as he can. He doesn't necessarily like the walking on the path. He just wants to get there as fast as he can. The middle brother is a little bit like the eldest. He would like to kind of get to the end of that path as fast as he can, but he's not necessarily as strong. He doesn't have as much stamina. So he decides to take some flights of fancy, right? To go off into the woods, hang out, have a little fun, and then get back and do the path. Finally, the youngest brother is, as typically youngest brothers are, he's got his head in the clouds a little bit. He loves the path. He loves to hike. And he takes his sweet time. So the end of the story is they all get to their end of the path. The eldest gets there fastest. He's a little exhausted, but then really excited about all the things he can do. The middle brother gets there a little bit slower, maybe not as exhausted, uh, but has less time to enjoy himself. And finally, the last brother gets there. And as he's coming to the end of the path, he does something that neither of his brothers can figure out. He turns around and starts to walk back in the direction he came from. Now, clearly, this is a parable. The idea is we all look at our careers and our lives in very different ways. There are kind of three archetypes or three prototypical brothers, especially when it comes to money making and careers. And the key is it's okay to be any of those but to connect with which one you are, because in our path to building wealth, so we can do those things we want, if you actually connect with what your style is, you're going to be a lot more successful at it. So who are older brothers? Older brothers are people like you and I who front load the sacrifice. We do a lot of really hard work at the beginning. Sometimes we grind it out because we have to, because that's what you do. We make as much money as we can. We invest we set our investments then on autopilot and then we enjoy ourselves, right? These are the prototypical fire people, the financial independents retire early, the people who made lots of money and got out while they were in their thirties. Middle brothers are more passive income people. So there's some people who don't mind working hard, but two things, one, they want to enjoy what they're doing. And two, they don't want to have to grind it out ever right? They want to be able to take breaks when they want to take breaks. These are the people who get really interested in passive income, passive income, like real estate, like blogs and podcasts, things that they enjoy doing well enough online stores, um, where they can eventually make enough money each month to support their monthly needs. So if they can get to that point where they have so-called passive income coming in at enough of an amount, they feel financially independent, whereas the eldest brother had to actually accumulate a certain net worth so that the money could support them. And then last but not least, you have the youngest brother. These are the dreamers, the artists, the people who love work. They go for what's called the passion play. They get a job that they love. And if you can find a job doing that you love and that job pays your bills, you're pretty much financially independent from day one. So that's the three brothers. There's front loading the sacrifice and being kind of the stereotypical fire type person. There is passive income. And then there's the passion play. Those are our tools to provide enough wealth to reach our general purpose identity and connections. There's only one other thing I always tell people is once you decide which path you want to take, you also have to ask one other question, which I think is really, really important is, are you afraid that you are going to die early and not experience all the things you want to experience? Or are you afraid you're going to live long and run out of money? And the reason why I think that's a really important question is it's going to change how you act in these roles of the three brothers. My father's a perfect example. Like I said, he died at the age of 40. He actually thought he was going to die young. He told my mom, hey, I don't think I'm going to live too long. So consequently, he didn't save a lot of money. He did the exact opposite of what an elder brother would do. He didn't save a huge amount of money. He made enough to support himself, 
but he spent a lot of time doing things he loved. Like he loved photography. He loved traveling. He loved languages. He was studying Hebrew when he died. Like he kind of did all of these things to enjoy the moment. He didn't save a lot of money. No, he did buy life insurance. So he didn't leave us out in the cold, but there wasn't this idea. I'm going to live a long time. So I better save a lot of money up me. I'm the exact opposite. I don't fear dying young. I fear not having enough money or running out of money when I'm older. So for me, it made a lot more sense to front load the sacrifice, really work hard, grind it out. I wasn't worried that I was going to lose a little time up front because I figured I had lots of years to go. So if you're worried about dying early, you probably don't want to save 50 or 75% of your income. You might want to save 10% and then use the rest for a YOLO fund. Go have fun, do what you want pursue those things that have interest for you, one of two things are going to happen. Either you are going to die young and then you lived a fabulous life, or you're not going to die young, but you've at least been saving 10%. You're thinking about financial independence. You're creating a financial framework. So you might have to work 10 or 20 years longer than an eldest brother would. But you know what? You've been enjoying all those years. So you've been working, but you've been doing the YOLO thing, spending money, et cetera. So that's why it's important. You've got to kind of think about what you think your lifeline is going to be to try to figure out, to kind of toggle how aggressive you are in your savings and financial independence. I found these parables so helpful, Jordan, for a couple of reasons. One, just the personal evaluation of saying, all right, well, hmm, which, one, which one do I find myself in here and, and what can it tell me about myself? And for, for me, I, you know, originally assumed I was the eldest because, you know, retiring early, writing a book about that. I'm, I am an eldest child in the first place. I'm kind of a go-getter, but I really resonated with the, uh, and found myself resonating more towards the middle child with, with the income streams, with the side hustles. And also with the a big part of my own journey has been, and this was, it wasn't all like just me figuring it out. It was other mentors saying, Hey, you ought to take a break, Chad, where I, took a lot of plateaus. And when you talked about the, the middle brother along the journey, wanders off and you know, takes a break, it takes a picnic and you know, goes into the field and kind of smells the flowers a little bit. You know, me getting married to my, to my wife, who was not the front loader, was much more of the, probably would have been on the, the passion mindset on her own, perhaps. I, I, maybe I need to let her speak for herself in that respect. <laughs> um, but I, we kind of met in the middle through the, um, in, in the, the middle child, I, th I think kind of the lifestyle we did choose was that I could have got, we could have retired earlier than we did if we would have pushed it harder. But in 2009, we took a four or five month break and backpacked around and went to South America. We had, um, you know, other times when we've taken time off and we pulled back from pushing it, pushing, and pushing it, being the big, biggest, best real estate investor we could be. So I found it interesting and in just kind of finding my own, in my, in our own as a couple kind of journey and where that's ended up. But I also found it, I, th I think it's so helpful as our, as all archetypes are not because to say you were only one of those, but we're all kind of a mix of those. And we have different traits that maybe dominate at different times. And I was remembering when the, the few years ago when Paula Pant interviewed um, Susie Orman on her podcast, and there's just big, you know, you know, up, uproar because, or it was interesting, fun uproar because Susie was like, I hate the fire movement. This is, you know, they're, they're, they're forgetting that when they turn 50 years old, they're going to run out of money and be destitute. And these bad things are going to happen. If you don't have $20 million or $10 million saved up, you're going to you live a destitute life. And when I, when I thought about the kind of the eldest mentality and, or this somebody who's always got to have enough, you know, more, more money, or, um, you know, Susie kind of fit, that fear of dying without enough money, like you mentioned, like that was hundred percent what Susie was trying to get into. And if that's your fear, then yeah, you better save up a lot more money. Whereas person on the other side of the archetype would say, you know, I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to experience this thing or have this, you know, I'm not, if you're a musician that I'm not going to give my music to the world, the biggest regret I could have, I would imagine for a lot of artists and musicians is dying with your music in you and not having expressed that. You'd rather be poor and you'd rather be destitute than have that be on your deathbed. And we're all individuals and we all have different fears. And so we're bringing it back to that original topic, you know, dying and be, what are you afraid of? And so I just, I found this so, those archetypes so helpful to help, help me think about that for myself and kind of tell my own story. And, and the importance is not whether you stick to one archetype, 
or whether you switch back and forth, like even as an eldest brother, I also did some passive income stuff. And some of my passive income was writing, which was a passion play. The point about it is being intentional, right? So this is the whole issue is I think we go about money and career and our lives so unintentionally, when you actually start breaking it down on how do I make money and what are the different paths I can take, it allows you to make choices. And so it's very rational to go from being an eldest brother to being a middle brother at some point in your career when all of a sudden you have enough money. Maybe you are not to financial independence, but you have enough saved up, what people used to call FU money, that you then can slow down a little bit. The idea is that we can create and design a life that works for us. And so life design means there's change. We're constantly, and this gets back to the art of subtraction, we're constantly changing to refine and make better, understanding the archetypes, understanding which brother you are at what time in life can just help you better plan so that you get the most out of those moments throughout life as opposed to you know, waiting till the end, which is what happens with hospice patients, or spending all your money and YOLOing like crazy and then having nothing when you get to the middle of you. Okay. And it's also understanding what intrinsically makes you happy too, that you're, you know, what makes Jordan happy, what makes me happy might not be the one, the, the path that's going to make you happy. You got to, you got to, you know, the old cliche, you got to go to walk your own path. You got to take your own fork in the road. Um, but I, I do, find, just like you said, I, I found it interesting shifting as time goes on. Like right now, my mindset that is very much about the craftsperson, the craftsman mindset. It just, I even had that like next to my bed, you know, a circle like that's, that really gives me enjoyment going deep on the craft, uh, not only of real estate investing, that was kind of my original craft. How can I be better at that? How can I understand it better? And be, uh, you know, not to get to some point where I have enough money, but just to be this craftsperson who's studies it and learns it. And then the same thing with podcasting and YouTubing that just, that gives me so much joy to be, that in that passion mindset. And for me, the, the front loading and the you know, middle child was kind of the path to get to there, but it's, it's helped me even reading your book, thinking about how can I tame that other voice to saying, Oh, that's not enough. You need to have a little bit more. You need to have a little bit more, which you, you talk about a lot in the book too, of, of leaning in on that archetype now of the passion mindset and saying, you know, that's, there's plenty. And even if there's not plenty, I'm making, you know, I, I can make money with my passion now. And, and so it's just uh, leaning in on the intrinsic motivations that, that are, are, are ultimately going to bring those things that you mentioned earlier, the, the joy, the connection, the people, th those are super meaningful and sometimes elusive though. They're hard to, hard to figure out how you find those things. I think ultimately we're all looking for what I like to call the climb, right? The climb is spending your time doing meaningful things that you feel like you're making progress towards. And I'll highlight making progress towards not necessarily achieving. I think that's actually, in my mind, probably the best definition of happiness. And I think what I heard you just say is, now that I'm financially stable, I have this luxury of looking at craftsmanship. What, what feels like the climb to me? Like, what is that thing that I just dig getting in and trying to build. And every day that I can make a little headway, I'm feeling good. And I think that's our ultimate goal. And I think that's what money is actually supposed to serve us. in. we just forgot it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, that vision of financial independence, Jordan, I think you, you've done something big by, it's a nuance. It's a nuanced view of it, but I'm going to read the, the definition that I think is just what you were just hitting there. That financial independence is the ability to fill one's time primarily with meaningful activities while also making enough money to survive. Yeah. And I love the juxtaposition of that is meaningful activities with your time. Who, who wouldn't want to do that? And yes, money's important as part of it. We got to survive. We got to have financial oxygen. But uh, this, the, the, the stories that you tell in this book, Jordan, really helped me personally to kind of figure out some of those, continue to figure out some of those questions. So just, again, want to thank you for what you've done with the book. I want to also give you a chance to I'm going to have another wrap up and ask you one more final question, but to tell people where they can find it, what, where it's going to be when they listen to this, it's going to be about a week before it comes out. So if you could just tell us a little bit about how, how they can get the book. So taking stock, a hospice doctor's advice on financial independence, building wealth and living a regret-free life will be available everywhere. August 2nd, 
wherever you want to find it, Amazon, Books a Million, et cetera. From the publisher themselves, it's Ulysses Press, but it's uh, Simon Schuster puts it out there. So that's who distributes it. Any of those places, um, check it out. I'd love to have you read it. I really want to get back to this idea of thoughtfulness when it comes to money and life and how to use money in the service of the lives we want to live. Well, I will put links in the show notes and the podcast and video description. It'll be out there. People check it out. It's going to be a good one. And I want to wrap it up, Jordan, with a question I ask everybody uh, on, on the podcast. And you know, people listening to this are going to be all sorts of different places on their journey to financial independence. And I love how we've kind of redefined that a little bit today of what that means. But for people who find themselves early in the journey, maybe they're in the grind of the day to day, maybe there's not even a how can I see where I'm going to be 10 years from now that it seems so far out there? Do you have any, any final advice for them as they're, as they're on that journey? Yeah, my final advice, especially to young people, is start where I ended. Start with your unique sense of purpose, identity, and connection. Spend some real time thinking about what those things are, and then use that as a path to financial independence, as opposed to doing what I did, which is I kind of made my way to financial independence and then had to circle back and figure out what I truly wanted to be in this world. I think that's the true gift and message of the dying, right? When you have six months left, all of a sudden you have a very little time to figure out who you are, what you're about, what you want to leave to the world. What if you had the gift of figuring that all out at 22 or 23? or 25, and then started looking at your financial life. Certainly those things may change in your 30s, may change in your 40s and 50s, but if we don't start thinking about them now, we never will. Wonderful advice. I'm taking that advice as well. And it is a lifelong journey. It's a, uh, as all philosophers of all, all times have, have said, you know, you, you start with that question and you live with it again, again, and again, but it's, such a great question and a great topic. So thank you for the book, Jordan. Thank you for being here with me today and look forward to connecting with you in person sometime soon. Yeah, for sure. And thanks for a great conversation as always. Enjoyed it. If you liked today's episode with Doc G, I want to invite you to join me again next week for a new episode where I have another interview, this time with someone named Marco Santarelli. And we're talking all about passive investing in real estate. Can you do that? How do you do that? Especially if you're long distance, if you're a busy employer or employee, you know, someone who has a business and you can't, don't have a lot of time to go out and find properties. How can you invest long distance and more turnkey style investing? That is what Marco Santorelli is an expert on and has been doing for years. And we're going to dig into that topic and I'm going to pick his brain about how that works and how you can do it. So join me for the next podcast episode. If you like the show, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my free email newsletter at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. In addition to weekly updates, articles, and behind the scenes tips from me, my email newsletter subscribers get my real estate investing toolkit, which includes a property closing checklist that I actually use when I buy properties, a real estate deal worksheet, a tenant screening criteria checklist, and other spreadsheets and goodies that will help you on your journey to financial independence using real estate. You can get it all for free at coachcarson.com forward slash REI toolkit. I also want to take this time to thank some people behind the scenes who make this podcast possible each and every week. This includes my podcast editor extraordinaire, Michael Wynn, my amazing virtual assistant, Megan Thompson, my wife, Carrie, who helps me behind the scenes and is my partner here at Coach Carson. And of course, thank you to all of you, the listeners of this show who make everything possible. This show exists for you. It exists because of you. And I really appreciate you being here for another episode. Everything I've shared with you in this episode has been for general education purposes. I've not considered your specific situation or risks. Before buying your own investments, be sure to consult a financial, real estate, and or a legal professional. Until next time, I'm Chad Carson. You can also call me Coach. And this is a show all about helping you get out of the financial grind so you can do more of what matters. See you next time.